أبدا لا لن نحيد أبدا لا لن نحيد أبدا لا لن نحيد عن خطى الإيمان دربنا درب قويم دربنا درب قويم بالهدى القرآن أبدا لا لن نحيد أبدا لا لن نحيد أبدا لا لن نحيد عن خطى الإيمان الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله محمد وآله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد فعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يريدون ليطفئوا نور الله يريدون ليطفئوا نور الله بأفواههم والله متم نوره ولو كره الكافرون صدق الله العظيم Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Holy Quran, given us as a lesson and given us some information so that we will always be alert, we will recognize, we will pick up on certain things which are normally not recognized. In the verse of Surah Tawbah and Surah As-Saf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looking at what took place at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we are speaking about the persecution that occurred at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And how they used to say words to tone them, to make a mockery out of them, to say things to sway the people against uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. To say things to block the minds of the people from listening to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. To say things so that those things may build a hatred in the minds and hearts of the people against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and against the Sahabas and against the teachings of the Holy Quran and against the teachings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This was the prime objective. And Allah mentioned that in the Holy Quran. What is, after all, what is behind this? Why people behave like that? Why did they persecute the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Why did they go after the Sahabas trying to kill them? mercilessly persecuting them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, there is only one objective. There is only one objective. Allah says, يُرِيدُونَ لِيُطْفِعُ نُورَ Allah Because they want to extinguish the light of Allah on the face of the earth. That is the objective. They want to remove the light of Allah that exists on the face of the earth. They want to destroy that light which Allah has sent on the face of the earth. And the bearers of the light are the Ambiyas. And when the Ambiyas and the prophets come with that light, and they share that light with others, those who believe in them get part of that light. So they are moving about with that light. And so to every believer who takes that light from them, he shares that light. And everybody who follows that path and gives the message of that prophet to the people, he is representing that light which Allah has sent on the face of the earth. So the attack on religion, the attack on Islam at that time and now, and the ta- attack on true teachings is really this purpose Allah is saying. يُرِيدُونَ لِيُطْفِيُ نُورَ Allah. The maqsad, the objective is all about that. All the laws that will make, be made, all the different things that can be put in place with technical justifiable reasons, it is all based on that maqsad and objective. يُرِيدُونَ لِيُطْفِيُ نُورَ Allah. In different countries, you cannot build a tall minaret because of so and so. That's not the maqsad. The maqsad is yuriduna liyutfiu nur Allah. Muslim sisters are banned from wearing the hijab and niqab in different lands, not because it causes harm, not because of anything. Only one objective Allah points out that in the Quran. Yuriduna liyutfiu nur Allah. They, they wish to extinguish the light. As we say, out oh, the light. They wish to remove the light because subhanallah, 
When the light is not there anymore, there will be total darkness. The darkness of the wickedness and the sins that people do. People love the type of life that animals live. To eat as you want, drink as you want, be with other women as you want, to steal, to exploit, to corrupt, to get into corruption. People do not like laws and orders. People do not like restrictions and limitations. People love freedom. They love what they do, even though, even though it might be detrimental to their own health. Don't people see the effects of drugs? But yet there is an increase in the users of drugs. Don't people see the effects in alcohol and intoxicants? Yes, they know it is being propagated, but you see an increase in the users of that. Don't people see the harms of sleeping illegally with women? The spread of the AIDS, AIDS virus that is killing millions and billions of the people on the face of the earth? Yes, they know. The statistics are there. The count is there. How many people in this country? How many people in that country? No matter what type of medication is invented, it cannot cure. It cannot stop. This is a disease about which the Prophet said in a hadith about the signs of the hour of judgment. A time will come that Allah will allow such diseases to occur on the face of the earth. There will be no cure for it. And it will kill many people. When people go into that type of life, knowing the consequences, they are actually committing suicide. Yet they do it because they see pleasure. They see pleasure in sins. They see pleasure in wrongdoings. They see pleasure in the things uh, that are totally harmful to them. But yet there is an increase. Yet there is an increase. Subhanallah. So people love freedom to do as they want. People don't like restrictions. People don't like laws. This is why you read the history of the prophets. Every single prophet was attacked by his people. Every single prophet was persecuted by his people. Na'uzabillah, some of them were killed by their own people. So, the reason is this. They know when the light of Allah comes, that light will dispel and remove the darkness of those sins. So they will have to hear, no more this, no more that, no more that type of life. And that is what the people do not want to hear. That is what the people do not want to hear. But Allah says, the Quran says, Wallahu walau karihal kafirun. But Allah will complete his light on the face of the earth, even though the unbelievers don't like it. Allah will allow thousands of lives to be lost. Allah will allow the believers to become martyred. He will allow their wives to become widows. Allah will allow their children to become orphans. Allah will allow the Sahabas and the followers of the prophets to be beheaded. Allah will allow all of that. But he wants his light established. And that light when it's established, it will go until the hour of judgment. Allah will do that. And that is Allah's promise. You and I will see in the history of Islam, no matter what was done to the Muslims, no matter what beating and flogging they got, no matter how much they were sent to jail, no, how much, no matter what was done, subhanallah, you will always find Muslims holding up the banner of Islam and moving it from one generation to the other generation. And they will never be cowed down by anybody because the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said it allah will always raise the people in this ummah who will carry out the religion of allah la yakhafuna lawmata laim they will fear no one in what they are doing and they will do that until the judgment of allah comes and the victory from allah comes what the prophets had to go through what happened to ibrahim alaihi salam after the fire, it didn't stop him. He came out and carried on. Yusuf salam, was jailed for years. And in those times, we can imagine what the jail was like. That didn't stop him. He came out and carried on. So therefore, it will go on. But no matter what happens, 
that amounts to taunts and ridicule and mockery and persecution and killing and murdering the believers. Allah says it boils down to wanting and you and I must pick that up. Yuriduna liyutfi'u nur Allah. The only objective is to out the what? The light of Islam. That is what they clearly said to Bilal. Reject Islam or swelter and die. We don't want this Islam. And that is what we were speaking about. When the Sahamas radiallahu ta'ala anhum, they were driven from their homes. They migrated to Abyssinia. We spoke about the second time when they came and they had to go back. And on that second occasion, we were speaking about when the king summoned them. And then Jafar ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala spoke to the king with eloquent speech which Allah had inspired him to speak about what they were and what they are now and who was this man that was sent to them. And then the king said to the Quraysh, Two of them representing the Quraysh who run behind the Sahabas to reach Abyssinia so that they can plead with the king. They can bribe them with, with gifts, expensive gifts, gifts, gold and silver coins so that the king will release them and they will carry them back to persecute them and kill them in Makkah. But the king was intelligent. He said, I must hear what these people are saying. And he heard it. That's the last thing we spoke about when Jafar ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala the beloved cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spoke with such eloquence yet when the Quraysh lost that case before the king they went home they went there where they were staying and they said we will surely get the king to send them back because we are going to say something that will cause the king to become extremely angry with them. So they came next day in front of the king and they said, Oh king, you know what? These people believe in a religion that speak against Isa alayhi salam and his mother. Because Muslims don't believe that Isa alayhi salam is God. Jesus is the son of God. Or Mary was the mother of God. We believe he is a prophet. But the Christians believe that he was more than that. And the king, the Najashi, or the niggas of Ethiopia, Abyssinia in those those days, he was a staunch Christian who knew the Bible, who knew the gospel of Jesus. So he summoned them again. They were thinking about what to say. And we mentioned that they all came to that decision. We will say exactly what our Rasul taught us to say. And they said who Isa a.s. was. They recited some verse which touched the heart, the heart of the king. And the king went into tears. And he said, by Allah, Jesus didn't say anything besides what you are saying. When that was finished, the king told to these people and he said that you people cannot take them. He rebuked them. He gave back all the gifts to them. And he mentioned that his kingdom, it doesn't work with bribery and that is not allowed. Jafar, Jafar ibn Abi Talib in that majlis and gathering, he said, O oh king, these people have come to force us back to our country, our place. But O oh king, I want to ask them three questions. And I want you to demand the answers from them before we leave this majlis and gathering. The king said, go right ahead. Jafar bin Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala and said, O king, I want you to ask them, are we slaves? Are we slaves in our country that if we have run away from our masters to get freedom? If we are slaves and we run away from our masters, we are willing to go back to Makkah. Take us back. And do whatever you want to do with us. But ask them are we slaves. The king, the Najashi of Abyssinia, he turned to the Quraysh unbelievers who were there. He says, are these people slaves in your land? Amr bin As, radiallahu ta'ala, who was then and not Muslim, and he became a Muslim afterwards. He said, bal ahrarun kiramun, no o king. They are noble people, well respected people who are free. They are not they are not slaves. They are not slaves. Jafar ibn Abi Talib said, O king, ask them for me. Have we killed anybody in our land? Have we murdered anybody? 
that for the sake of safety we run away from our land to hide? If we have killed anybody, if we have murdered anybody, then we are willing to go back. Let them take us back. We are ready to go back. But ask them that question. The king turned to Amr ibn al-As. He said, have they killed anybody in your land? Are they murderers? Amr ibn al-As, he turned to the Najashi, the king, and he said, La qatarata min damin, not even a single drip of blood have they spilled. Subhanallah. They have never killed anybody. They are not like that. They are people who would cause no harm to other people. Jafar ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala and said, O king, ask them for me. Have we stolen the wealth of anybody? Taken their money and run away with it to your land? Are we thieves? Have we taken their property and wealth? The king asked the question to Amr ibn al-As. Amr ibn al-As replied, he said, La qirata, not even a single dime they have taken from anybody. They are free from that. After hearing the answers to the three questions, the king, being a very intelligent person, turned to the Quraysh who represented their people. He turned to them and he says, Then, what is the matter with you? Why have you traveled so far, running behind the blood and the lives of these people? What is the problem with you? Why have you come to force them back in your land where you are persecuting them? Tell me why. Amr ibn al-Asr said, He said, O king, the truth is this. We all belong to one religion. We followed the religion. They followed the same religion. But then after some time, they left our religion and adopted a new religion. And because of that, we became angry with them. And this is why we are here to take them back, to force them to go back to their old religion. The Najashi looked at the Muslims, the Sahabas. He said, tell me, what is this religion that you had left? And what is this religion that you have gone into that have made these people so upset? They are displeased. They dislike you. They want to kill you for that. What is that religion? The spokesperson Jafar ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala and again he stood in front of the sahabas and he started to answer the king. He said, Ayyuhal Malik He said, O king kunna alayhi. As for the religion that we were upon with them Fadinu shaitan that was the religion of Satan. Subhanallah. That was the religion of shaitan. That religion which teaches you to worship idols and carve images and stones and trees and animals and pictures. And to worship every other thing besides the one true God, Allah. That religion is the religion of shaitan, O king. We were upon that religion. And we were upon the laws and the orders of shaitan. Shaitan ordered that we should take others besides Allah and we did that. Shaitan ordered us to commit all these wrongs and we did that. Shaitan ordered us to be oppressive and steal and consume intoxicants. And we did all of that. So O oh king. We were upon the religion of shaitan and we were upon the orders of shaitan. Nukafiru billah. We denied Allah openly. We denied Allah. Never believed in Allah. Rejected Allah. That is who we were. And we used to worship stones, lifeless beings that cannot hear us. Lifeless beings. That is what? That's the religion we were on, O king. That's the religion. What we are upon now. This religion which you have asked about, the religion we are upon now, that is the religion of Allah. To acknowledge, to accept, and to believe that there is only one God. And to worship only that one God. It is the deen of Allah. It is the deen of the true creator. Nukhbiruka. We are informing you as we have done in the past. Anna Allah ba'atha ilayna rasula. 
that Allah has sent to us a messenger. Kama ba'atha ila ladhina min qablina. Just as he has sent prophets in the past. Like how he has sent Jesus, Isa. And how he has sent Musa. And how he has sent Abraham. So Allah sent a prophet to us just as he has sent to those people before us. فَآتَانَ بِالصِّدِقِ وَالْبِرِّ So he brought to us the truth. And he brought to us righteousness. وَنَهَانَ عَنْ عِبَادَةِ الْأَوْثَانِ And he prohibited us from worshipping idols and images. He prohibited us. فَصَدَّقْنَاهُ وَآمَنَّا بِهِ وَاتَّبَعْنَاهُ So we considered him to be truthful. We believed in him. And we followed him. فَلَمَّا فَعَلْنَا ذَلِكَ أَعْدَانَا قَوْمُنَا But when we did that, O King, our own people, our family members, our own tribesmen became our enemies when we did that. They became our enemies. وَأَرَادُوا قَتْلَ النَّبِيَ الصَّادِقِ And they intended to kill the true prophet of Allah. وَرَدَّنَا فِي عِبَادَةِ الْأَوْثَانِ And they wish to return us to the worshipping of idols and carved images. فَفَرَّرْنَا إِلَيْكَ بِدِينِنَا وَدِمَائِنَا So because of that, O King, we ran towards you to your land. We ran with our deen. We ran with our lives to you for safety. وَلَوْ أَكَرَّنَا قَوْمُنَا لَأَسْتَقْرَرْنَا He says, if our people and our tribe, they had allowed us to live in that land, we would have lived it. We wouldn't have run away to your land. فَذَلِكَ خَبْرُنَا So, O King, that is our affair. That is what we have to see. When the king heard that, he said, you people shall remain here in safety. And nobody will be allowed to do you no harm. And so, these people were sent back humiliated. And the Sahaba started to live in the land of Abyssinia. They remained there for a while until the time the Prophet migrated to Medina, which was in 13 AH. This occurred somewhere in 5 AH. So we are speaking about eight years or so. During that time, the king of Naj the Najashi and the king of Abyssinia treated them well, with love, with kindness, looked after their needs. And when it came for that time for the Muslims to migrate to meet the Prophet وسلم, in Medina, the king sent them off, provided transport for them, gave them a lot of gifts, gave them provisions for the journey. And while bidding them farewell to the land of Medina, the king came. He said to Jafar ibn Abi Talib, he said, when you go and you meet your Prophet, Tell him how I treated you. Convey my salams to him. And tell him I believe that there is no God but Allah. And I accept him as the final messenger of Allah. He accepted Islam. Subhanallah. Tell him to make dua for me. Jafar ibn Abi Talib left with the Sahabas. The king also sent a qasid like an ambassador to ensure that everything goes well and the journey is safe. They arrived in, to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. In a hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "The happiest moment is when he met Jafar. He hugged him and kissed him on his forehead. They have separated so long on account of persecution, on account of so many things, and these Sahabas had to run away." They didn't know what the future held, what will happen. And now he's meeting Jafar and all those beloved Sahabas who were with him. So when they sat in front of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Qasid, the ambassador who was sent by the king said to Jafar, tell your Prophet what my king has asked you to tell him. Jafar ibn Abi Talib then said, O oh, Prophet of Allah, you sent us to a king. He treated us so good and he spoke about every single good thing about the king. He said, and while we were leaving, he gave us provisions for the journey. 
He looked after our needs. He sent transport with us. He says, O Prophet of Allah, he has asked me to convey salams to you. And he bears witness that there is no God but Allah. And he bears witness that you are a Prophet of Allah and you are the final Prophet. And he has asked you, O Prophet of Allah, to make dua for him. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sitting. He got up. He made wudu. He stood up. And he raised his hands. And he said, Allahumma gfir lin najashi. Allahumma gfir lin najashi. Allahumma gfir lin najashi. O Allah, forgive the king of Abyssinia. Forgive the king of Abyssinia. Forgive the king of Abyssinia. Then, after some time, when the Najashi passed away, revelation came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The angel came to him immediately and he said the Najashi has died. And upon that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died in Abyssinia. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in Medina. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, out of that great love and respect, Allah informed him that he should do the janazah salat for the king of Abyssinia, Najashi. So he stood and the Sahaba stood after him and he performed janazah as recorded in the hadith of Imam Bukhari for the Najashi, for the Abyssinian king. He was able to get the, the salat read by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But the ahadith in Sahih al-Bukhari where that hadith is mentioned, the commentators of Sahih al-Bukhari, they mention in commentating an explanation of that. He said when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked to do that, Jibreel alayhi salam came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, O Prophet of Allah, should I roll up the earth for you? So though, though the land is far, it will come close. So that the buyer of the Najashi will be raised in front of your sight. And you will be looking at it when you read the Janazah. The Prophet said yes. Jibreel salam struck his wing onto the earth. And that far distant land became short. With Allah's izn and permission. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was looking at the buyer. The Janazah of the Najashi. And he read Janazah there. And the Sahabas followed after him. That was the honor which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to the Najashi. And that is what happened. But my dear respected brothers, my dear sisters, when the Quraysh realized that they couldn't do anything to bring back those Sahabas to whom the king of Abyssinia had given refuge, they became extremely angry that there was no hope for them in the Sahabas of what? Abyssinia. They came back filled up with anger, heated to do something so that they can fulfill their heart's desire. What they couldn't get there, they could do it here. At that time, during, within a few months' time, two of the greatest then unbelievers that all the Arabs feared most accepted Islam, subhanAllah. That all the Arabs feared most from among everyone. Those two people accepted Islam. Who were those people? Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala. The most feared man. Even the hadith says, Shaitan used to fear Umar radiallahu ta'ala. Authentic hadith. That even Shaitan used to fear Umar. Umar accepted Islam. That was a big blow to the enemies of Islam. Because Umar was the same one. That when these people came back. And they realized that one. The Muslims. Although they are putting more and more pressure on the Muslims. With such persecution. Tying up. Beating. Flogging. Putting on burning charcoal. Putting on stones. And all these things. Yet with all of that. People were accepting Islam. Allahu Akbar. They were accepting Islam. And those who had accepted, they never rejected Islam on account of that persecution. So they reached a stage where they said, they said, we have to finish this man Muhammad because he is their leader. Once he dies and he is killed, that's the end. 
in a gathering by the Kaaba. In a gathering by the Kaaba. They turned to each other and they said, but who will do it? Who will do it? Subhanallah. You know, we always say, hidayat and guidance in the hands of Allah. You don't know to whom Allah can give that guidance. Umar radiallahu ta'ala stood up. He took out the sword of his sheet. He said, I, I will do it. I will finish Muhammad today. I will finish Muhammad. Subhanallah. Everybody said, yes, Umar, you the man for it. You can do it. Nobody but you can do this. Umar radiallahu ta'ala hastily left the gathering, moving towards the house of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. While he was on the way, moving hastily with the sword in his hand, ready to strike that blow to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he met another person who had accepted Islam. But they knew each other because, I mean, they lived in the same community. So he said, Omar, where are you going? Where are you after? In such haste, you look angry. Where are you going to? He said, I'm going to finish Muhammad. This matter has gone too, too far. It can't go any further. I am going to finish Muhammad. So he said, you know what? You better fix your house first before you go to Muhammad because your sister had already accepted Islam. So fix your house first and then go. Oh my God. With that, he became more enraged. Mine sister, mine family will accept the religion of that man. So he turned and moved to the house. There was one companion. Because his sister and brother-in-law accepted Islam. And there was a Sahabi who was teaching them the ayats of the Quran and surahs of the Quran. And Umar came in a rage and started to not knock but bang the doors we will see. Saying in a harsh tone, open up, open up. The person who was teaching realized it was Umar. He went in a corner and he hid himself. He knew Umar. The sister, she took the scripts of the Quran written on the, 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 the leaves and she hid it. Then she came. Umar did not ask any question. As soon as he entered, he said, Oh, enemy of yourself, have you forsaken the religion of your forefathers? And he started to beat his sister and slap her. And he knocked her on the ground. The brother-in-law came and said, Oh, Umar, listen well, listen. He started to beat the, the brother-in-law also. When his sister fell on the ground, when the sister, her head started to bleed, when he saw that blood, his heart started to become a little softer. He said, okay, tell me, what were you doing? What were you doing? He looked around and he saw the little paper leaves, the leaves of the Quranic ayah. He went to touch it. The sister rushed towards it and said, no, 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 you can't touch that. You are impure, you can't touch that. Those are the words of Allah. Go and take a bath first and then you may come and touch these words. Umar radiallahu ta'ala and came. He took a bath, took a bath and he said, let me see. And when he saw, the first thing he read was the ayah in which Allah says, certainly I am Allah and there is no God but me. Allahu Akbar, when Umar read that, it was something that penetrated his heart and changed him immediately. He said, take me to Muhammad. Look at the change. Look at that change. The man who left to slay Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wants to see Muhammad. He's going. And uh, he's going to the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When he goes there, two sahabas who will normally be the doorkeepers, they stood up and they saw Umar walking. Ah, oh, they became frightened. They knew the um, what Umar is capable of and what was said by the Kaaba that he's going to finish Muhammad. So they rushed inside. They said, Oh, Prophet of Allah, Umar is coming. And it seems that he has some bad intention. They said, Should we finish him off before he reaches you? The Prophet said, No, let him come in. Let him come in. 
And subhanallah, as Umar was coming in, the Prophet saw the change in Umar's face. He came in front of the Prophet and he said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa annaka Muhammada Rasulullah. I bear witness there is no God but Allah. And I bear witness that you, Muhammad, you are the messenger of Allah. From that day, Umar was a changed man. Umar was a changed man. And that is something the unbelievers could not tolerate. Umar radiallahu ta'ala and accepted Islam. When Umar accepted Islam, before the Muslims had no permission to perform salat by the Kaaba, now they have permission because everybody is scared of Umar. Umar will challenge anybody to come. Come for a battle. If you want. If you want to make your wives, widows, and your children off and come and meet Umar outside. Nobody dared to go to Umar radiallahu ta'ala. He was one. And the other person that Allah used to strengthen Islam was Hamza radiallahu ta'ala an. Hamza radiallahu ta'ala an. Hamza radiallahu ta'ala was such a great warrior, was such a brave man, was so strong, was so great that even he was called Asadullahi wa Asadu Rasuli, as it is mentioned on authentic narration, he was the lion of Allah and the lion of the Rasul. Hamza was great. The acceptance of Islam by these two. A great personalities was a big blow against the unbelievers. But with all of that, that angered them. It angered them. And they held an emergency meeting by the Kaaba where all the chiefs and the, all the other heads of the tribe. And they said, we have to do something about this. This matter has reached too far. Omar has accepted Islam. Hamza has accepted Islam. People are accepting Islam. We have to do something about it. They decided that they will make an agreement among all tribes that they will boycott Banu Hashim, the family to whom the Prophet ﷺ belonged, and Abu Talib, and every single person. So they wrote an agreement, starting with the words, Bi ismihi ta'ala, in the name of Allah. And it was a long thing that from today on, there is total boycott against the Prophet Muhammad, about, uh, against Muhammad, his entire family, and all those who associate with them. No selling to them, no giving food or drink, no marriage with them, no speaking with them. They shall be ostracized. They will be put away from everybody. When they wrote that, and they stuck it onto the Kaaba. That became a binding agreement among all the tribes to uphold that. When Abu Talib realized what was happening, he decided to take his nephew, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and a few Muslims, and those unbelievers who wanted to be with them, not on account of Islam, but on account of family relation. And he went to a valley. He went to a valley so that he will be away of all, from all of them. Three years they remained there. Boycotted from everyone. Those were three difficult, difficult, hard years for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That was very, very difficult. That took place from 7 AH until 10 AH. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is still in Makkah under the persecution of the Quraysh. So it goes further, but we will stop here today, and inshallah, we will go into a little bit of what took place while they were isolated and boycotted from every other person in Makkah at that time. والآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين أبدا لا لنحيد أبدا لا لنحيد أبدا لا لنحيد عن خطى الإيمان دربنا درب قويم دربنا درب قويم بالهدى القرآن أبدا لا لنحيد أبدا لا لنحيد أبدا لا لنحيد عن خطى الإيمان دربنا درب قويم دربنا درب قويم بالهدى القرآن سائر في طريق الحق يا جند الله سائر